Hi, Nancy. I think you're muted. I, I missed your introduction there. I am muted. Funny that. I'll start that all over again. <laughs> um, everybody, welcome to the panel discussion on tobacco harm reduction. We are going to discuss this from different perspectives. This is Amanda Wheeler. Thank you for that, Amanda. Um, this is Ace Salagupta from End Cigarette Smoking in Thailand. And last but never least, Dr. Colin Mendelson. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining Hi. us today. Um, I guess the best way to start off is let's talk about the stories of how we got involved in tobacco harm reduction. I would like to start with you, Amanda, because I haven't spoken to you before. So welcome. And please tell us how you got involved in tobacco harm reduction. Ah, thanks for having me. I will try to make a long story very uh, concise. Um, you know, um, many years ago, my husband and I were both uh, very uh, heavily addicted cigarette smokers. Uh, he was a two to three pack a day smoker. I was a pack a day smoker. Um, the stakes were very high for me. I had cancer when I was 19 years old. I went through a year of chemotherapy, radiation, was very, very ill, um, unrelated to smoking. But, but suffice it to say, when you go through cancer and cancer treatment, it's strongly recommended that you stop smoking. And, uh, you know, despite going through all of those health issues, I continued to smoke for another 10 years after that. Um, I, I tried consistently for 10 years to stop and never found anything that worked for me. And then, um, you know, one weekend, my husband was uh, going into the smoke shop to buy his usual couple of cartons of cigarettes for the week. And, um, you know, he ran into his first encounter with a vaping device. This was back in 2009. Um, you know, he purchased it, he tried it and was able to quit smoking in a weekend. Um, you know, um, obviously this was uh, something when you're in a marriage, you know, you don't want one person smoking and one person not. And so, you know, I, I started vaping. I had a very similar experience. It took about a month for me to stop smoking entirely, but for the first time in my life, um, it really wasn't a struggle. You know, what I what I noticed is I felt so much better. I smelled so much better. Um, food tasted better. I, I wasn't, you know, uh, waking up, coughing up things every morning. And so it, it was probably the the easiest way I had ever encountered to quit and the only way that was truly successful for me. Um, you know, it was it was driven by that personal experience um, that we wanted to share it with other people in our community. Like back at this time, um, vaping was not prevalent in the United States at all. Um, um, there, there weren't a lot of products in the marketplace. And so, you know, we opened up a business in our local community and 10 years later, here we are, we have um, six vape shops now. Um, we both continue to be smoke free all these many years later and just wildly successful. And we've been able to help um, tens of thousands of other adults in the United States quit smoking. It's something we're very proud of. Um, we really got involved in the fight for advocacy um, probably in about 2014, um, just as a result of, of, you know, wanting to defend our business and to defend our customers uh, from things that we started to see happen in the United States and been very heavily involved in advocacy ever since. Excellent. Thank you for doing that. I know plenty of people in the States that, you know, have actually converted and switched over and it's people like you that have helped them. Because I remember when I was still in the States, all we could get at the very beginning were those little cigar like things and they were useless. So yep. thank you. Um, Ace, next, give us your story, please. Hi, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for inviting me here and greetings to, I, I don't know what to say. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. But uh, my, <laughs> my story is that uh, I was a smoker for probably almost 38 years and I have tried every way to quit including the quit line and uh, uh, 
a quitting clinic in in the states back when I was there. I tried to quit. I really try, and I did quit uh, cold turkey probably about 20 times. It worked every time. But the next morning, uh, I just went out to Seven Eleven and bought uh, another pack of cigarettes. Yeah. Uh, finally, I found elect- electronic cigarettes about mm, about 10, 10 years ago. Actually, before that, but it didn't work. And after the cigarette like then uh, I got an advice from a friend saying, you know, like uh, every time you feel like you want to smoke, pick up an electronic cigarette instead. And I did that. And since then, I never look back. I never touch a single cigarette. And, and it's become the really stinky, even, you know, the smell. Mm-hmm. So I did really quit because uh, of uh, vaporizers by using electronic cigarettes. And it had became my passion because, uh, uh, like Amanda, I have a lot of close ones who smoked, and uh, I did really help them quit by uh, introducing to electronic cigarettes and the proper way to use it. And I mean, hundreds of people around me got a better health because of electronic cigarettes. So yeah, and also I want to add, and if you would kind of articulate on this Asa the screen keeps moving so that's why my eyes are jiggling around I'm not losing my mind yet a group of you from ECST actually went and did chest x-rays and health checks as well to prove can you our little expand on that a little bit yeah of course uh, a few years back I think it was the we did what we call uh, the uh, world web day before the the actual world web day so uh, to coincide with the world no smoking day uh i started personally i started by you know like uh about 10 years while i was still smoking i did the chest x-ray and there were spots in the x-ray and the doctors the directors of the hospital in, actually uh, he was very concerned but uh, told me to quit smoking and i still couldn't and a few years back, you know, it, it's, I just realized, I said, hey, why not uh, do some chest x-ray? And uh, the doctor also uh, like advised me to do like the, the blowing, the, the lung capacity test. You know, you mm-hmm. have to blow into the two spirometer yep. lung capacity. And he was surprised that, uh, you know, all the spots are gone and my lung was really in good health. And so I invited, uh, our the members of uh, ECST, which our Facebook group, we have like about a hundred thousand people, and uh, we just gathered like about twenty something, about two dozens people to do the same. Especially, we want the people who did some chest X-ray in the past that have some spots and results. All of them results are the same. Uh, the results of our X-rays are really healthy, and and uh, we have some comment from the doctor said, you know the the age of our lungs looks younger than our actual age. So, mm. yeah, pretty much that's, that's what we did. About 20, about two dozens of us, we went and yeah. have the chest x-ray and lung capacity test. Yeah, that's pretty amazing, actually. Now, Doc, you're here. You're listening to this. Um, you are one of the few GPs and medical people that actually understands and believes in THR. What is your motivation for helping people get off of combustibles. Nancy, so thank you so much for asking me and congratulations on this outstanding uh, exercise. The video said it all, didn't it? I don't know if we can really add much to that. It was fantastic. Uh, look, I guess I'm the odd one out. Um, I've never smoked, I've never vaped, but I grew up in a cloud of smoke. Um, my father was a smoker. Um, he was a doctor, knew how bad it was, couldn't quit and he and my father-in-law both died from smoking. Um, And I became a GP, developed a special interest in smoking, Uh, became involved in teaching and research, uh, became known as the smoking doctor because there weren't many doctors involved in smoking. But even as the smoking doctor, I was having very low success rates. Most of my patients were not being successful and it was very frustrating for them and for me. So, As we became aware of vaping uh, in the mid-2010s, 
Uh, I actually went to London. I spoke to Peter Hayek, Martin Dockerell, Clive Bates, who really piqued my, my growing interest in this field. I came back to Australia thinking, great, we have all this evidence. Everyone will listen now. I wrote an article for the Medical Journal of Australia. And there was pretty much dead silence. Um, and you know, this was incredibly frustrating. I found vaping in my practice was working extremely well, although there was a lot of hostility to it. So I became more and more involved in advocacy and in trying to uh, educate doctors and the public about vaping because as we all know, there is so much misinformation. And uh, uh, my career since then has been about advocacy. I've been involved in teaching, doing lectures on uh, on vaping uh, and research and trying to challenge the establishment, which doesn't want to change its uh, traditional direction um, and just uh, isn't really interested in tobacco harm reduction in Australia. Why do you think that is in general that the medical profession, a lot of people seem so, they just don't even want to acknowledge it. They don't want to look at it. What is it that causes them to be like that? You know, it's not about the evidence. Uh, you know, I naively thought, well, we'll show them the evidence. Here is the most popular quitting aid in the Western world. Here is the most effective quitting aid. And it's an aid that people are willing to use and it's working. And you would have thought that would do the job, but it's clearly a lot more than that. And I think what's happening is, as Clive was saying, is that people are opposing vaping for all the wrong reasons. It's all about the abstinence ideology, moral issues, uh, big tobacco, uh, vested interests, financial interests, uh, political agendas. And I think they justify their opposition by things like, which are gonna sound much better, like, oh, but we're just thinking of the kids or we can't let the tobacco company uh, take over. And then they maintain that bias with, you know, confirmation bias and conformity bias and uh, group think and all that stuff. So it's very hard to argue the evidence with people who are actually not about the evidence, even though they're, they're, they're medical practitioners, they're not looking at the evidence and they're not accepting the evidence, as Clive said, or was it Eden, even when the evidence is there that they're asking for, they won't accept it. So that, that's what we're up against. Yeah, you know, interesting that you brought that up about, you know, there is this ideological idea that vaping is a big tobacco construct. And this is going to come back at you, Amanda, because what's going on in the United States, besides being shocking and appalling, is do they realize that they're trying to hand the entire industry to the enemy and killing an entire billion dollar industry? Can you explain that? Because that is just defies logic. I, I, I think they are aware of it. I think they want to treat it like the elephant in the room. Maybe if we don't acknowledge it, maybe we don't have to have an honest conversation about that in the U.S. who these actions are, are, are going to benefit. Um, the United States based advocates spent year, years warning the FDA warning the United States Congress, warning anyone who would listen, that um, the way regulations in the states are being handled are going to hand a monopoly over this technology to Big Tobacco, who they claim to be the people that, that they hate and who they're operating against, um, when in reality, uh, it seems that they're doing everything they can to ensure that Big Tobacco has a monopoly over this space. Um, you know, things like the um, Food and Drug Administration's application approval process, what's going on the last few months here, 93% um, of the applications from small and independent businesses have been summarily denied. Um, those companies have no option now but to fight in court. Um, there's an outrageous tax being proposed in the United States Congress right now that every stock market analyst uh, that I've seen cover this has said, uh, you know, they're big tobacco stocks. They recommend people immediately purchase because this, this tax will give such a boost to big tobacco companies over small and independent businesses. And so I, I think it's when people... Um, pretend that they're not aware that these actions will directly lead to a monopoly. Uh, I think it's it's feigned ignorance. I don't think it's very authentic at all. There, there's certainly been more than enough of us uh, attempting to highlight this issue. Do you think that they're going to try to create a separate MSA for vape? 
like they did with tobacco? Do you think that might be what's behind all of this? I, I do. I do. I think, um, you know, uh, five companies are easier to regulate than 500 companies, right? Um, I, I, this whole process with what we've seen with um, market authorizations, with um, uh, recent PACT Act requirements for reporting um, sales taxes, and that also included shipping, shipping restrictions. And now what we're seeing with this proposed uh, federal vape tax for the first time in United States history, a federal tax on vapor products. I do. I think that is all, um, you know, pieces that they're putting into place to pave the way to a vape MSA, certainly. Yeah, because I mean, that's another thing we've been dealing with in Asia um, is that, you know, for example, I'll give you Malaysia, right? Malaysia is going to legalize, but they're going to tax. Um, a lot of governments because of COVID are losing revenue. And they're going to try to claw back as much of that as they possibly can through taxing whatever they can possibly tax. Which brings me to ASA, because ASA is interesting. He lives in a country where the government has a very high vested interest in tobacco. How does this all play out for you, ASA, when you're sitting here listening to all of this? Yeah, um, hmm. It, it, it's really funny because, like, uh, like you just said, you know, like uh, Thailand has uh, uh, its own tobacco, uh, cigarette production, manufacturing plants, whatever you want to call it, but, but still it's, it, it controlled the majority of uh, cigarette and uh, the people who smoke. <coughs> and uh, we produce our own cigarette, which are like kind of well known all over and uh, the, the brands and everything. And uh, yeah, um, it's difficult to say because uh, like they, they are fighting uh, harm reduction and we are trying to say I, I have been uh, at lately uh, I was with the at I had to be at the parliament every week I was part of the uh, subcommittees to kind of like to lift the ban it, it was the discussion on how to tax tax cigarettes tobacco and electronic cigarettes. So we are trying to give out the uh, evidence, the scientific evidence saying how safer electronic cigarettes compare mm -hmm. is compared to regular uh, combustible cigarettes. And uh, I have been blamed by some doctors here saying that, you know, I belong to tobacco industry and I shouldn't be within that subcommittee is why why other people you know who receive direct funds from uh, big tobacco here in Thailand the tobacco manufacturing company are allowed to come out and uh, speak in public and uh, sit in many many committees so it's it's a there's a big conflict of interest going on here and uh yeah like you said you know it's 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 weird and for those of you who still don't know uh thailand had uh, we have we still have a law on uh, it is illegal to import to manufacture and to distribute electronic uh electronic cigarette including you cannot vape uh, at a place where it's a no smoking zone so uh electronic cigarette had already been categorized as tobacco products but still you know like you cannot import you cannot distribute you mm -hmm. cannot uh, manufacture electronic cigarettes and that leads also to uh, bribery because like police uh, there, there will be some some very few police policemen um, saying that since it is illegal to import manufacture and uh, distribute then possession and the act of vaping itself is illegal which actually you know by the law it is not but you know that's that's mm -hmm. how bribery is going on so it's really confusing time right now and it had been for several years and that's one of the things that we are fighting for and uh, so it's, it's a big conflict of interest going on here i think there's a big conflict of interest in the entire situation and what, what's going on with that big meeting that's virtual meeting that's happening right now that Ethan mentioned at the end of his presentation that person who I choose to call Voldemort 
Um, I want to ask Amanda something about Voldemort. I haven't forgotten you, Colin. Um, we know that that individual has had, tried to flex his muscles quite strongly in low and middle income countries. What is his influence in his own home country? It can't be overstated. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how familiar people around the globe are with the American uh, two-party system, but um, Voldemort, Mort, as you say, is is quite entrenched into one of those political parties, even uh, attempting to run for president as that party's nominee and has been um, a very heavy donor to everyone in that party that is in a major position of, of power and, and, you know, a major, major funder of, of candidates at all levels of government, um, a shadow funder of all of these NGOs that uh, push for taxes and bans and push for FDA to remove products from the market and deny applications. So that, um, that influence is felt very strongly in the United States, um, the level of funding that has gone to anti-vaping media and advertisements in the United States has made uh, public opinion here on vaping quite toxic um, to the degree that the majority of adults feel that uh, vaping is just as bad or worse than smoking, um, specifically because of the hundreds of millions of dollars that were spent on advertisements to malign a really life-saving technology. Um, and, and so it's it's very insidious at all level of government. Um, I, I mean, you can take it down to individual city government decisions all the way up to the United States Food and Drug Administration. It's pervasive everywhere. Okay, so it's not, it, it's a, he, he's flexing his muscles, quote unquote, everywhere. Leads me to Colin. Um, you know, one of the things that I always, I mean, even though I sound like I'm from New York, and yes, I'm originally from New York, I do live in New Zealand. One of the things that always amazes me is the difference between New Zealand and Australia. Now, I still to this day don't quite understand why they're so diametrically opposed when it comes to tobacco harm reduction. Do you have any insight on that? Well, um, Nancy, one of the issues is that we think in Australia that we're pretty good with tobacco control. So we have certain organisations and individuals who think they've done a fantastic job and therefore they're untouchable and uh, the way that they've approached tobacco control should continue. And to some extent, I think they're protecting their legacy, uh, but they're trying to say, look, we've done such a great job, we don't need things like this, which are potentially risky. And I, I think they've been driving a lot of the debate in Australia against vaping. Uh, it is very distressing looking across the Tasman and seeing, you know, our Kiwi cousins taking a very different and so much more sensible view as they have in so many other things. You know, New Zealand's been quite progressive in a whole range of other social issues. Um, but in Australia, yeah, we are very conservative. And I do think the $17 billion in cigarette tax is playing a role in Australia. It's our fourth biggest tax. Uh, we have the highest cigarette prices in the world. Um, New Zealand's not far behind. But uh, yeah, I don't. I think New Zealand has definitely been more progressive. Mind you, there was that court case in New Zealand, which uh, where PMI took um, the Ministry of Health to court, and that kind of turned things around the corner. But still, I think New Zealand was, was more in favour long before uh, before we before you know, earlier in the piece yeah i have a question from the audience you ready for this people here we go in the philippines malaysia and indonesia vapes are now included or shortly will be in the tax code which is a nod to the financial disruption that they have caused a loss of tobacco tax revenue etc regulation of the actual product proportionate or not is yet to be tabled in these three countries in, the, in our view, the view of the panel, is this a viable and sustainable step towards a more reasonable regulatory approach from more enlightened governments? Especially considering that the governments of Malaysia and the Philippines are both signatories to FCTC, so that the decision to regulate and not ban, does this automatically mean that other COP9 countries or delegates will echo the position or not? What are your thoughts on all of that? 
kind of complicated. Yeah. The, 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 the summary explanation is that there's going to be countries that are going to be going to COP9 and they have progressive regulation. Do you believe that those people speaking out and speaking up for that is going to influence other delegates and possibly help turn the tide towards risk proportionate regulation of reduced harm products? I, th I think anytime anybody can credibly speak out and, and speak up on behalf of reduced risk uh, products, you know, that um, at a certain point you have to hit a critical mass of voices bringing that perspective, but someone's got to break the ice, right? And, and so, so anybody attending that can be that voice to deliver that message, I, I think, is a ray of hope that others may follow in their footsteps and start start building up some sort of critical mass to change. As far as the specific question on um, Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia, I will leave that to someone who has more expertise in that part of the globe than I do. But I, I think uh, pro tobacco harm reduction voices speaking up are always going to be helpful. Colin? Yeah, like I, I, I agree. I mean, the more people we have, uh, the more countries we have supporting tobacco harm reduction, I think there is a critical point, tipping point, where we are going to break through. As Ethan suggested, though, um, it's not going to be a quick process. And, and it was shocking hearing the decades of struggle they've had uh, in the same game plan uh, of the war against drugs as we're seeing now and, and the long time it took. People just don't seem to have learned. Uh, so it's going to be a slow process, but this is definitely part of it, getting getting people on side, uh, countries on side, and gradually building, building a consensus in that direction. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the question remains, I mean, how do we know, how, what, how do governments know what their delegates are actually saying when they're there? And then how do we find out? Because it's so secretive. We really don't know what they're saying or what they're doing. And that, you know, that, that brings us to the next issue of, you know, we're sitting here and we're trying to advocate for something. And it's very possible that if we go to somebody who's, you know, a representative and they say, yeah, 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 we support you, we support you, that doesn't necess necessarily mean they're going to go and actually represent that point of view. They may just follow the party line. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, really, it boils down to we have a lot of work ahead of us, and, and, and it's on many different levels, you know. And usually the first port of call for most people is they go to their GP when they want to quit smoking. And that first port of call, unless they get somebody like Colin, are basically they're told patches, gum, whatever is available now, I don't even know. How, I mean, here in New Zealand, if you're a vapor, you're not supposed to be listed as a smoker. And some GPs still continue to put you down as a smoker, which is illegal. But, you know, people don't want to fight it, okay? So Colin, as a doctor, say I want to go, I'm, I, you know, I've tried everything I possibly can, okay, and I'm going to go to this GP, and this GP is going to turn around and try to put me on, pat, on the same crap that, I, that didn't work the first time. How do we break through that? Well, that, the problem is that the patients do need to see the GP in Australia. I mean, otherwise there are huge fines for possessing and importing nicotine. So the patients need a prescription, so they have to go to the GP. And the GPs have been getting negative messaging about vaping for decades now, or for years, for many years, from you know, the AMA and from the various health authorities. And now from the College of GPs, which is our professional organisation, they've, they've said, yes, look, you can do this, but we kind of the, the subtext is we really don't think it's right and you need to be very, very careful and you can only do it under these conditions. And the message to the GPs is clearly we don't really support this. And the GPs don't know anything about it. Like, they've read the alarming media headlines and the studies show that GPs get their information from the media. They haven't had training. Uh, they haven't got time to do their own research. So the GPs um, are mostly opposed to vaping. Uh, there's about 80 GPs in Australia publicly who have said that they will um, write nicotine scripts out of 41,000 GPs. So we've got a big problem. We've created this model which isn't, isn't going to work. Uh, and the GPs are very worried because the government has classified nicotine as a medicine, but it doesn't meet the criteria of medicines. Normally with a medicine, you expect a certain level of quality, um, follow-up, 
uh, analysis, government support, TGA approval, that's our medicines regulator, but they don't have that. And then you're being asked to prescribe it, and therefore they're responsible if there are any problems. If the patient buys a dodgy batch, the GP is responsible, but the GP has no control and no assurance that the products are okay. So GPs are anxious about that. But I think more, most importantly, if they did some research, they'd find out that it does have an important role, but they just don't know. They don't know how to write a prescription. They don't understand the benefits. And basically, they're being told not to do it. So in Australia, it's, it's this model that's being set up, is, is, it's bound to fail, in my opinion. Do you think it was de developed, I mean, there's some people that I've spoken to and they've said, well, the reason they've done this and the reason they're doing all these bans is because they need the money from the tobacco excise and that they're, they're putting the money ahead of the health of people. But yet, mm. they can prescribe nicotine like replacement therapies and I believe that mm. they're starting to use nicotine for some neurodegenerative, I said it right, diseases. So how does that, I don't understand, how, how does that, it doesn't compute? No, the... You know, the, the tobacco tax is our fourth biggest tax in Australia. And you'd have to be naive to think that that wasn't a consideration. Um, and, and if we allowed vaping, we could have a vaping industry uh, and we could uh, get tax from that. We could have an industry which employs people and um, collect GST and, and all the other benefits of having an industry. But, mm -hmm. you know, the, the experts have decided that that's uh, we, 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 we just can't allow that because, you know, people really should just quit smoking and they should just quit nicotine and uh, that's the direction they're taking. Okay. Amanda, are doctors like that in the States too? Yeah, I don't, I don't, it's not been my personal experience that there are very many doctors at all in the United States that are progressive on this issue that promote uh, tobacco harm reduction. I think um, most doctors in the United States, are, um, you know, have have very bad information about it or not quick to promote it at all. Um, I've I've heard from a lot of vapors in the United States that have actually, you know, made it a point to to have an ongoing dialogue about this with their personal physician to to, to kind of share their personal experience with their doctors to help educate doctors on on what's going on with people's real lived experience to hope that might change mm -hmm. some minds. But, you know, for now, I would say the medical community is is very um, anti vape here, especially with uh, what went on with uh, the Evali cases last year being conflated with nicotine vaping, I think certainly made the opinion among the medical community um, worse uh, as far as vaping is concerned. Yeah, because one of the thing that, things that's very interesting that I've noticed, thanks for that, Amanda, is that Australia can be influenced by, the, by, by America and then Asia is influenced by Australia. So it's kind of got this whole trickle-down effect thing going on. Um, we have a question from Pippa for you, Colin. Um, the science in Australia seems to get drowned out at government decision level, although great science is being done at the University of Queensland, for example. How can real science get heard at the government level? Look, I don't think the government wants to hear the science, uh, um, Pippa. Um, the, the evidence is very clear now. I mean, the national, um, uh, what's it called, the NIHR in the UK just did a report recently which clearly said that vaping was the most effective quitting aid, more than uh, Champix or Chantix, more than NRT, more than uh, bupropion or Zyban, Wellbutrin. We know it works, and we know, you know the College of GPs says, of, of physicians in the UK says it's no more than 5% ha as harmful. And it's the most popular product. I mean, it has the most potential to improve public health uh, of just about anything that we have. And yet, and the evidence is there, and yet they're not listening. And, and that's what I said before. It's not about you can't engage them on the evidence, because even when they have the evidence, they say, well, we haven't got it. But even when we have it, they're not interested because they have their agenda, they have their, they have their, their reasons for doing what they're doing. They may not even realise what they are and they justify it with all sorts of silly arguments. But um, the evidence isn't going to cut through. I think what's going to work is political pressure because this is a political decision. And I think the solution is going to be a mass movement. The number of vaping vapors is growing rapidly in Australia. And I think vapors need to get active 
ring their members of parliament and let them know that vaping is an important issue that, that they're committed to. Go and see their MPs and, and, and let them know that this is a voting issue. And there's enough voters in every electorate to make that message very loud and clear because that's all they care about. They don't care about the evidence, they care about getting elected at the next election. That's insane. That's so insane. Amanda, in the States, I haven't forgotten you, Asa, don't worry. In the States, um, I know the CASA is very active and they do a lot of call to actions and things like that. Do Is there a reticence on a lot of vapors parts for not wanting to get involved and not wanting to stick their neck out? You know, um, we are living in interesting times in the States right now, as everyone around the world is. Um, uh, the political discourse in our country right now is just absolutely out of control um, on, on many, many topics. And, you know, I think um, there's a sort of fatigue that sets in with people. You know, certainly this has been a long battle uh, that consumers have been waging in the United States. And, you know, I, there, there was quite a bit of fatigue that had set in over 2019 and 2020. And of course, you know, uh, people are dealing with their own personal struggles during the pandemic. It was a tough year. Um, I, what I've seen this year, um, you know, particularly in the last three to four months in the States is a renewed consumer interest in getting engaged, um, a renewed interest, um, even from many small business owners who are also, uh, vaping consumers. Um, and, and so I do think that that is starting to pick back up. Um, I, you know, I, back in, you know, the 2015, 2016 era, um, we had a very loud, very vocal community of, of vaping consumers here. And, and I think that, you know, they were um, sort of worn down over time of, of so many battles lost. You know, um, we went through very tough times in 2019 and 2020 with vaping laws and vaping regulations around the country. And I think a lot of people got very discouraged. Um, but I, I think right now what we're seeing is that people are starting to pay attention again. Some of that outrage that people feel um, is starting to come back in the form of, of actions. Um, in the U.S., um, you know, it's estimated that about 6% of adults use vaping products. So that transition, that translates to about 15 million people. And, you know, if we could just get a fraction of those people really mobilized to take action on this, uh, like Colin said, we would see a huge and, and, and quick uh, change in the tides here. And it's just a matter of, of getting all of the vapors informed and, and, and providing entryways for them to get active on this. And CASA certainly is doing a wonderful job of that here in America. Yeah. Yeah. We have a question. I'm going to ask Asa to answer it first and then I'll ask the, your other two to please explain or answer anyway. In the panel's opinion, to what extent do you think a government has the right to determine what an adult can put into their own body in this case, lower harm products, particularly given the easy access to cigarettes. Asa, you're up first. Yeah, um, that that actually that is a trick question. The right <laughs> that the government, <laughs> the right that the government have uh, actually no, they don't. Especially you know the basic human right, and if you want to compare like a combustible cigarettes to something that they had categorized and I'm, I'm using uh, example in Thailand here that they had categorized uh, electronic cigarette as a part of a tobacco product while uh, according to the question like uh, cigarettes are being sold everywhere I mean every no every street every supply I mean you, you just walk around you can buy cigarettes any any and everywhere uh, why something that is safer is a definitely a safer alternative. Like I've mentioned earlier that, you know, I did some chest x-ray and, and whatnot. And you don't need a chest x-ray to tell that your health is it's much improved after you quit smoking. And uh, so it's really weird that uh, the government, while letting something that is more harmful to your health, uh, be sold anywhere, everywhere, but uh, they're still denied the right to access uh, something that is definitely safer. I mean, I'm not even saying safer or, or more uh, more harmful, but since, you know, if they had already categorized it as the same kind of product, and uh, so yeah. why ban and why uh, so much fuss and adore and 
a lot of misinformation coming out trying to get people one point that i've heard some doctors you know some anti said they said uh, they said they don't want to introduce new new products into the market but you know you have to consider that uh, like uh, in the states we don't have that much uh, vapors but we have i imagine we have uh, one to two million vapors uh in the country while the government still look at uh, there's a, a national statistic uh, organizations that they did all the stats and whatnot and they said well they had estimated from their questionnaires they said that there's about 70,000 vapors here in thailand and i'm going like uh excuse me you know like i have over a hundred thousand followers there was once uh, one of uh, our web pages that we had almost half a million subscribers. And so, yeah. you know, it, it's kind of like, why did you get the money? 70,000 vapors. I said, like, you know, like, and, and we had asked several weeks, say, you know, who did get to do the question? Who did they ask? And nobody said, like, not me. And of course, not me and not, not any of our... Uh, vaping communities so but uh, the answer is no but uh that's, that's weird because like they they shouldn't decide on what we put in our body at the first place the basic human right but then again you know the doctor uh, in the big meeting about three years ago that i went to uh, that i attended i was invited and uh, said that the minute you pick up a cigarette you lose the basic human right so i mean that, that's kind of a mindset that and i i couldn't accept it you know, yeah, the minute no. you pick up a cigarette you lose the basic human right yeah yeah now i remember you telling me that amanda what's your take on that well you know the the, the question asked the panel's opinion right and and yeah. my opinion is absolutely not they don't have the right to tell us what we can put in our bodies uh, but the government uh, that I live under exercises that right on a fairly frequent uh, basis, but they're very picky and choosy on on how they do that, right? If I um, wanted to smoke, you know, two packs of cigarettes a day in this country, I have the freedom to do that. If I wanted to drink a fifth of whiskey every day, I would have the freedom to do that. If I wanted to smoke cannabis from the time I woke up until the time I went to sleep, I could do that in, in certain parts of the country. If I wanted to uh, take psychedelic drugs, I could do that. And in other areas of the country, I can even take much harder drugs and, and be supported in doing that in a more safe fashion, right? Um, yeah. But when it comes to this one particular uh, area, uh, vaping, the, the official position of the United States at this moment in time is that there is exactly one product uh, authorized legal for sale in this country for consumers to put into their body. And uh, it's a product that nobody has used in many, many years because it's, you know, about a decade old technology that's that's uh, sold to no one at this point. And, and that is the only product that our government says we have the right to put in our bodies at this point. So um, in my opinion, no. Um, do they exercise that hypocritical right as often as they can? And yes, they do. Okay, thank you for that. I agree. Colin, uh, Australia. Yeah, look, I, <laughs> I just think it's such a case of government overreach. I mean, in a liberal democracy, the government has no right to say to people what they can put in their bodies as long as they're not harming anyone else. And it, it comes back to the, the harm principle uh, by John Mill, which is that, you know, adults should be able to make those decisions as long as they're not hurting anyone else. And, and there's other issues here. I mean, there's the whole autonomy issue. People have, should have the right to do what's best for their health. Uh, you know, we know that vaping will improve health and government should be supporting that. And yet they're taking away that right from people. And particularly they're taking away that right from the most disadvantaged groups in society. Mm -hmm. There's a social justice issue here as well. They're saying to people who smoke much more heavily and have much higher rates a smoking related disease people with uh, who are most vulnerable no you can't use that either we're going to tax the hell out of you but we're not yeah. going to let you um take this way out 
And it reminds me of a quote which I'll give you from Grover Norquist, who said, people should decide what they do and don't put in their body. It's, their, it's none of their government's goddamn business. Yeah. He's the president of the ATA in the US, and I think yeah. he says it very well. Yeah, we have a statement here. Um, you would think the government would realize how much money they would save from future medical expenses due to smoking by allowing the safer alternative. You would think. I remember a discussion, though, in saying that. I remember a discussion I had at GFM with people from the UK. And I remember one of them said, well, you know what, maybe the government doesn't want this because, you know, if the people cark it, that's less money they have to pay in their old age. And I thought that was the most horrible thing, you know, to, 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 to say. And now here I am, like, five years down the road, and I'm thinking – Huh? What's that about? Um, it's a, it, we're in a we're in a strange, strange time, especially now, with you know some countries trying to say that, that that vaping you know doesn't help with COVID and the smoking COVID thing. You would think with the smoking COVID thing, they'd be like, all right, you know what? If we think smoking is, is hurting people when or causing them to have more negative reactions to COVID, maybe we should allow this. No. Nope. It's nicotine. The problem is nicotine. And that's the thing I think we need to get to the down to drill down to the root cause. Why are they so against nicotine? What do you think, Asa? What do I think? Why? I really don't know. But uh, what is funny is that uh, what they are supporting, um, I, I put it loosely, is the they are supporting something that has uh, uh, stronger nicotine strength like uh, if you know the nicotine patches and the gums and and, and uh, the spray uh, it contains much more nicotine than even cigarettes itself i mean let alone electronic cigarette or vaporizers that has like much much less nicotine i mean the strength of what they support and what they say that should be uh, the correct smoking cessation they are, uh, contain lots and lots more nicotine because they think that people are dependent on nicotine by they i don't know I, I don't think they realize that it's the not not the yes of course it's nicotine that got you addicted but it's the same as sugar and and caffeine and and uh monosodium glutamate and and other uh other substances that are all over the places and and are allowed while uh nicotine itself is it's yes it's got you addicted but it's not got, what got you kill or what what make you uh, ill it's the tar yeah. and it's the combust combustion yeah that is no, I, the main culprit yeah it's that's why i don't understand these whole very low nicotine cigarette thing that they're, they're trying to push that here in new zealand and i'm just kind of like uh mm. if combustion is a problem and people are gonna smoke those they think that people will just stop smoking because they're not getting their nicotine hit um yeah, Colin, <laughs> I know, it's just like what um one question I have for Amanda on this, because she's got the you have the vendor perspective, and I want the vendor perspective on this. When you look at this as a vendor, and you look at what the FDA is doing, and you look at how the government seems not to not only not accept tobacco harm reduction, but don't really give a damn about an independent, you know, business SMEs. I mean, what is your recourse? Because I'm sure that it's going to happen in other countries. If it's happening in, at your country, it's going to happen everywhere else. What would you say to them if they encounter the same thing? Well, you know, I, I will say I'm very proud of the business community in the United States right now. Um, we, uh, sorry, it's late at night here. I've got my okay. little daughter in the background here who's okay. supposed to be in bed. Um, but, you know, one of the things that the business community in the United States is doing a very good job uh, at is fighting the FDA in the federal uh, appeals courts here. And so far, every case that's been brought in the United States Federal Court of Appeals, um, the judges have ruled in favor of the businesses so far, um, not in favor of the FDA. Uh, in any of those up to this point, and those cases are still in the very early stages. But I would say, you know, use every legal recourse you have 
available to you until you've exhausted every single one of them. I mean, the the court system is really that final frontier in the United States in our checks and balances system of government. And so it's been heartening to see some of the rulings that have come down in the last couple of weeks, because that really was our last avenue of, of recourse to what the FDA has done here. And, and so far, um, some of the early indications have been quite positive. Okay, but yeah, good. That's good. That's heartening. I have one last question for the panel. Um, if Voldemort, and we all know who Voldemort is, had endorsed vaping instead of demanding a prohibitionist mindset from the recipients of his largesse, would we be less concerned or even support the pernicious corruption of so many countries on THR? So let's just say Voldemort, instead of pushing for bans, was pushing for countries to adopt THR. How would we feel about that? Would it still be just as bad as him pushing bans? What do you think, Colin? I'll give it to you. Oh, I wouldn't have a problem with that. If he was pushing a measure which would improve public health, uh, I'm all behind it. If he was pushing a, 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 a strategy that was strongly evidence-based and which was going to save lives and cut out the black market and uh, solve all the other problems. Uh, I, I haven't got a problem with that. That that's that's what any decent person would do. Even though it's corruption, even if he did it by corruption. Oh, if he did it by corruption, uh, I didn't see that part of the question. Uh, well, I, I don't know if I could support that, but certainly if he used his <laughs> money to fund groups and influence the World Health Organization and uh, political parties. Um, in a legal sense, uh, and he was doing it for all the right reasons, uh, I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Okay. Asa? Thanks, Colin. I, I totally agree with Colin, you know, like uh, anyone actually, not not the Voldemort himself, but anyone who wants to turn around and support harm reduction in any kind, type or form, you know, I'm all for it. But uh, uh, that would Going back to say, like, uh, we have to say the, the corruption is another thing that we have to think about. But uh, as long as, okay, let, let, I mean, let's face it, there are no such, I, I don't think there's, there's uh, you cannot get rid of corruption, but it's mm -hmm. on the degrees, more or less. And if some type of form of uh, corruption occurred, why benefit? the people in general i'm all for it really yeah. because uh it's it's one way or another corruption will happen but if it happened to benefit the people the health yeah. of the people and going towards our cause hey yeah, yeah i'm all for it too yeah exactly amanda <laughs> you, you know i i spend a lot of my time dealing with corrupt uh government uh actions and you know corrupt actors and in influencing the government and you know i i certainly don't want to be the one dishing that out to accomplish a goal you know i mean it's that classic question of do the ends justify the means and you know i i think that we can win with uh with with truth and and hard work and and loud voices on our side and you know, there is funding that has to happen, but I don't think any of that needs to be corrupt in any type of way. There are plenty of non-corrupt ways uh, to fund advocacy and to fund getting a message across. So uh, I, I'm not really one that, that's going to say, you know, we should use their same terrible uh, means to justify the ends, because I think we are um, in the middle of a very noble fight. And I'm maybe uh, naive, but I'd like to win it with uh with truth and, and justice and, uh, and, you know, just a lot of hard work on our side. Yeah. Asa, you uh, want to say something? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> of, of, yeah, definitely. I, yeah, I also agree with Amanda. What I just said, I didn't want to sound like I will, I will, uh, we will, uh, stoop down to the level of corruption. Of course, you know, what we had done we what we had been doing for so many years, is uh, we give out the correct information uh, we are honest we are really honest about our, our passion it's our passion and we are honest about it and uh, of course we don't want uh, corruption to be part of us but what i was saying is that if the opposition you know the antis and and the people 
who are opposing to us want to turn around and like i don't know some kind of corruption occurs that will benefit people as that's why i said yeah i'm i'm okay with that but not of course not us we we are we are fighting for the right to benefit our health and you know we are doing it cleanly we had been doing that for many years so uh that's what i was trying to say but not i'm not saying that we should go out and and give bright people uh yeah, give, no. give bright money to officials and things like that yeah, no, because two wrongs don't make a right. I mean, and it, 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 to summarize it, I mean, it, it, if the funding followed the truth, instead of promulgating lies, it would be justifiable. You know, it, it, the, the high road, yeah. let's just say it, it took the high road. Mm. I mean, it's one of these things that, you know, Colin will know this, Asa will know this, Amanda, you're going to find out. Most people who know me know this. I'm always saying, let's take the high road. Don't sink to their level because two wrongs don't make a right, you know, kind of thing. It just it, it, it doesn't work. Um that's pretty much what we've got i want to know anybody have any final thoughts they'd like to give to the audience and the people that are watching us colin um yeah i just keep coming back to the fact that we need to keep our eye on the the goal here which is i'm sorry about that light on my face um which is 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 what's best for health um we get distracted by you know the war against nicotine we get distracted by we've got a We've got to bring down the tobacco industry. Um, we've got to stop smoking. Well, um, or we've got to stop tobacco, but really what we need to do is stop smoking because uh, that's what's causing the harm to public health. And th that's where our focus should be. Is this measure, whatever we're doing, is it going to help the health of people? Uh, and we, we, we get distracted by so many other priorities. Yeah, that's true. Amanda? You know, my, my final thought here is uh, it's it's always darkest before the dawn. And I think certainly um, we're at a very dark time in vaping policy in the United States. And I don't think we're alone in that. I think around the globe, many of us um, are at a very critical juncture in, in the way this is going to go as far as how tobacco harm reduction is handled or if it has an opportunity to continue to exist in, in various countries around the globe. And so I, my message to anybody watching, I know we're all in, in very different struggles depending on where we are you know, in the world, but w none of us are in this alone. We're, we're all fighting every day for this. And, you know, when, when you feel discouraged, when you feel like giving up, just remember there are so many like-minded people that are absolutely cheering for you and your efforts and what you're doing. We're all fighting our own struggles. And I think we can all win this together um, because we're all fighting together. And I, I believe in us very strong. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Thank you all for joining me today. I know it's late for you, Amanda. Thank you. You're going to sleep so well tonight. Um, thanks, Ace. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you to the audience for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed that. And um, Careful will be back tomorrow, same time, discussing nicotine. So make a note of it, and I will see you all then. So until then, stay safe, stay well, be good. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.